It's an exciting time as Latitudes takes us around the world. Come on a journey with us through the mysterious golden land known as Myanmar. Visit her peaceful people and pagoda. Get damp and dirty and relive trench life at the Imperial War Museum in London. Enjoy yourself in Tasmania where we embark on a tour starting from Hobart. This and much, much more on Latitudes. Welcome to the mysterious golden land, giant golden pagodas, amber flooded sunsets. Nothing but peace and serenity amongst the many towering pagoda. This is mysterious Burma, locally known as Myanmar. Our first stop is the majestic Shwedagon Pagoda, shining golden in the capital of Yangon. The pagoda is a place where monks and locals gather to pray. Tourists come here to lap up the serenity and be enchanted by its majestic structures. Towering almost 100 metres above the green cityscape of Yangon, the Shwedagon Pagoda is the prominent landmark visible for miles around. Shwedagon is the essence of Myanmar and a place that never fails to enchant. One of the wonders of the world, the Shwedagon is believed to have been built approximately 2,500 years ago. The legend of Shwedagon tells of two merchant brothers meeting the Buddha who gave them eight strands of his hair to be enshrined in Shwedagon. With the help of a number of celestial beings, the brothers and the king discovered the hill where the relics of the previous Buddhas have been enshrined. When the strands of the Buddha's hair were safely enshrined, a golden slab was laid on the relic's chamber and a golden pagoda built on it. All across the Myanmar landscape lie many pagoda and images of Buddha. Upon Minhama Hill in the township of Insain, Yangon, a huge slab of flawless marble that was found north of Mandalay is being visited daily. Sitting on a hill overlooking Yangon sits the majestic white marble Buddha named Loka Chanta Abaya Labamuni. People from all around the country come to visit and pray here. It's the biggest Buddha image in the world. Work on the surrounding temple that will house this image of Buddha is still being finished. However, that doesn't deter the hundreds of thousands of people that come to visit the statue. Chanta means happy and Abaya means no danger. So according to the name, it means good luck and no harm, which is good for everyone. What more assurance would you need to come and visit this spectacular image? This giant image of Buddha weighs more than 400 tons and measures a towering 37 feet tall. The flawless rock was 500 tons in weight and two temporary railroads were built to transport the massive slab. It was made by sculptor Yu Tor Tor from a large marble rock which was found originally in Zakin village, Mataya township about 21 miles north of Mandalay. Yutoto asked for permission from leaders of the state to carve the marble rock into the Buddha image. More than a hundred thousand locals turned out to witness the moving of the Buddha statue, which stopped at many townships along the way. If you're ever in this part of Myanmar, Make sure you visit this magnificent and majestic marble Buddha. Calm your spirit down to the murmur of the locals praying and humble yourself to the cultural tradition. Compared to its neighbours, India, China, Laos and Thailand, Myanmar has barely been visited by the outside world. Its bustling streets, golden pagoda and rich culture remain untouched and is just right for those looking for an alternative destination in Asia. Mingle with her people, shop around and find that bargain that lies just around the corner. Barter with the shop dealer to get the cheapest price. Yangon is the centre of the country's administration and economy, and the city is usually vibrant with various commercial activities emanating from the Delta area, which is the rice bowl of the country. Yangon is slowly opening up her country to the outside commercial world. Those wishing to stay in the lap of luxury during their trip won't be disappointed at the many five-star hotels available. 
The Strand, one of the most established hotels in the capital, provides an utmost standard of accommodation. With only 32 suites, two restaurants and 24-hour butler service, the Strand is small but nonetheless perfect for your travel needs. Yangon is the capital city and gateway to Myanmar by sea and by air. There are many places to visit among which the following places may draw your interest. Gems Museum, where priceless gems of Myanmar, such as ruby, jade and pearl, are displayed among many interesting gems. There are many jewel shops offering a wide range of Myanmar-made jewellery to meet one's taste and budget. If your stomach needs attention, the streets are lined with bar-like shacks that you can sit in front of and have a delicious meal. Taste the local cuisine and familiarise yourself with the people and the language. Come and visit Myanmar in its transitional stage, as it still remains an exciting and exotic place to travel. Where the exotica is still untouched, it provides the visitors with excitement and wonder. This is the Imperial War Museum in London, which was founded in the United Kingdom in 1920. Since then, it has grown as a living memorial to conflicts involving British and Commonwealth nations from 1914 to the present day. Currently running is a special exhibition featuring trench life in the First World War. Original uniforms, equipment, diaries, letters and film footage are on display. The exhibit highlights the fact that trench warfare created a unique world of its own. Relive and experience firsthand the hostility and the claustrophobia of a trench. On display are the many well-preserved items, such as letters to loved ones and equipment and clothing. The way the exhibit is built is an experience in its own. With the help of special sound effects and old film footage, you actually feel as though you are in a real trench. Visitors have the chance to inspect the general living conditions, such as sleeping arrangements and toilets. Take a step into the lavatory room and check underneath the seat covers for valuable information. This unique experience also takes you through a real-to-life replica of a dugout. Climb the ladders and imagine the strain of impending attacks. These children sound the alarm for a chemical attack and rush to put on a gas mask. The experience is as real as it can be. It educates both the young and old through hands-on activities. Moving on to the World War II period, another popular exhibit is that of the replica 1940s home. This home recreates a typical house during that period, which Londoners remember as the Blitz. For almost a whole year, the capital endured constant bombing, the worst attack sustaining 57 consecutive nights. Just walking through the home activates the imagination of the visitors, and the person's first eye view helps recreate the moment in their minds. If educating your children about aesthetics is important to you, then they will certainly enjoy the museum's special holiday program called Nature of the Beast. The children have to draw an animal based on one of the machines on display. The aim of the program is to captivate children's imagination through art. It makes them pay more attention to the object and encourages them to think about what they're looking at. They begin to understand through concept what the many objects on exhibit really are. By giving these objects personalities, they slowly turn from being lifeless models into real things that real people used. If it's aeroplanes you want to see, then go to the Imperial War Museum's aviation base at Duxford. Here at Duxford Base, many people come from all around the country to watch the many restored classic planes come back to life and see their exhibits on the airfield. Over 200 historic aircraft are on show and it still has an operational runway. Duxford is known as one of the world's leading aviation museums and has historical significance as a fighter station whose service career spanned two world wars. 
It played an important role in the Battle of Britain, and much of the airfield is preserved as it was during the 1940s. The aerodrome was built during the First World War and was one of the earliest Royal Air Force stations. It became one of the country's key training stations and now houses the current collection of aviation past heroes. Walk in and around and underneath these restored aircraft and see the interior of their fuselage and jet engines. This hangar boasts the largest and diversest range of aircraft and their recent addition to the collection is a newly restored vintage de Havilland Tiger Moth trainer aircraft. Spitfires, various jet models, Harriers and bombers are amongst the many different aircraft on display. Thanks to Marshall Aerospace, a local company founded by 98-year-old Sir Arthur Marshall, this Tiger Moth was restored to its former glory so that the younger generations could appreciate this wonderful aircraft. Between 1943 and 1945, Duxford was an active United States 8th Army Air Force fighter base. This special Anglo-American link was celebrated with the opening of a dedicated area at Duxford, the American Air Museum in Britain. It is here, alongside the collection of American planes and fighter jets, that most of the museum's restoration work is carried out. This department is devoted to restoring aircraft to their former glory. The work is largely carried out in full view of the visitors, just one of the many other things to see at the museum. The restoration team is made up of mostly ex-services staff. The team of about 20 work with the support of up to 150 volunteers. This department is considered amongst one of the biggest and best restoration facilities in the world. The work undertaken here is for more conservational purposes rather than airworthiness. Like all Imperial War Museum branches, the Duxford branch also take their education program seriously. Allow your children and their teachers to fully familiarise themselves with all concerns about aviation and aviation history. Here, Sue Chippington, the head of education, engages the children as well as the adults on a different level of what they experience at home or in the classroom. This young boy tries out an old wartime aircraft ejector seat. It provides an activity that gives younger generations a real idea of what pilots experienced. And it's able to engage their minds while they have fun. Guaranteed they won't be disappointed. Interact with the museum staff and the many wonderful live exhibits. Hold and touch the many items in their vast collections. And if you're pretty fickle-minded and fidgety at museums, then the Imperial War Museum will prove to be much more exciting and enthralling an experience for you. For a similar war feel experience, come and visit the Churchill Secret War Rooms. Used by Winston Churchill and his military team during World War II, the secret war rooms have been a favourite destination of excursion groups and tourists. This was the British government's secret headquarters throughout the war. The men and women coordinating the military campaigns would live underground. Churchill slept here and had a secret hotline to America's President Roosevelt installed. Since 1945, many of the tiny rooms have been closed off to the public and fallen into disrepair. Thanks to the £7.5 million facelift, tourists will be able to walk through the war rooms in all its former glory. It is this warren that is being renovated and restored and will be walked through by many generations to come. Come here and appreciate the secret society of the early 20th century and immerse yourself in an environment where secret meetings, dealings and conspiracies were conducted. Welcome to Hobart, the capital of Tasmania, 
an island just south of Victoria, Australia. Here, historic Georgian sandstone warehouses built in the 1830s and 40s provide a glorious backdrop to the Hobart City Council's Salamanca Market. Held at Salamanca Place every Saturday from 8.30 till 3 p.m. Craftspeople, buskers, artists, fruiters, shoppers, browsers and people watchers all help to set the scene of this colourful cosmopolitan and entertaining event. Its stalls sell everything from quality handcrafted goods that Tasmanians are famous for to fresh garden produce, natural skincare products, clothes and fashion accessories, flowers, bric-a-brac and collectibles. Salamanca Market successfully combining lifestyle with heritage. Sea Captain Andrew Haig built the beautiful Georgian house Narina at Battery Point in 1836. In 1956, the state government purchased the property to establish it as Australia's first folk museum. Hobart's premier heritage collection is there for all to enjoy. Experience the elegant lifestyle of a prosperous Hobart merchant and his family in the 19th century. A wonderland of colonial treasures, furniture, costumes, dolls, porcelain, needlework, a flagstone courtyard, carriages and a penny-farthing bicycle. Narina has something for everyone. At the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery, you'll find natural science, history and visual arts all in one venue. Visitors are welcome seven days a week. There's no charge for admission to the permanent collection on display in the many galleries. These buildings date back to the colony's earliest times and reflect some of Australia's finest architecture. Cruise on the Derwent. Derwent River Cruises Harbour highlights tour the river continuously every day. From Brook Street Pier to the Sullivan's Cove, Hobart's birthplace and on past the Royal Hobart Regatta Ground and beautiful Government House. Then under the Tasman Bridge, passing by the Royal Tasmanian Botanical Gardens Cornelian Bay and across to Lindisfarne. Back through the repaired section of the Tasman Bridge and over the sunken Lake Illawarra and downriver to Rest Point Casino for a short stop. Around historic Battery Point and back to Sullivan's Cove. The cruise lasts about an hour and 20 minutes. Afternoon tea and bar service are available. Kick back and relax and enjoy the waterways of the Derwent River. It's a whole new ball game at Putters Golf, Hobart's most exciting world-class attraction. Miniature golf on an amazing scale. Two fantastic putting courses set amongst a magical landscape of waterfalls, water worlds and amazing, beautiful gardens. Outside is the mountain. 18 holes of putting amongst rocky outcrops on huge greens with challenging banks and turns, sand traps, rough turf and rock hazards. Inside is the mill, spread over three levels with a cascading water wheel in a unique Tasmanian rainforest display. This is not just mini golf, it's something totally new for the whole family to enjoy. Inside, too, are Putter's virtual golf simulators with state-of-the-art computers providing the feel of a full-size golf course as you hit real golf balls with real clubs. Lose yourself in the competition and come to Putter's Golf. It goes without saying that Cadbury's is on the must-see list of just about every visitor to Tasmania. This world-famous producer of fine chocolates dates back to 1831 when John Cadbury opened his little shop in Birmingham. In 1922, Cadbury came to Claremont, Tasmania, and today its 700 workers produce a wide range of products, the famous Cadbury assortments, and no fewer than eight tonnes of block chocolate every hour. Visitors of all ages flock to the factory Mondays to Fridays to tour the complex with expert guides and to visit the huge chocolate shop and the unique Cadbury souvenirs and gifts. It's essential to book. Just phone the factory or contact your nearest Tasmanian travel centre. Chief boating is a fantastic experience. 
The 30 minute thrill ride on the Devil Jet has the driver skillfully manoeuvring along the Derwent's riverbanks, through shallow water skimming over white water rapids, past great scenery. Throw in a few 360 degree spins in this 20k round trip and you have jet boating at its best. Voted by Getaway 98 as Australia's number one ride, Devil Jet caters for all ages and all wet weather gear and life jackets are supplied. Continuing further through the Derwent Valley, we come to the Plenty River and Australia's oldest trout hatchery. The salmon ponds were established in 1864 and today supply over a million trout each year for the stocking of Tasmania's lakes and rivers. The trout hatchery and museum of trout fishing give an insight into the pond's history and the arrival of the first trout over to Tasmania in 1864, following unsuccessful attempts to introduce salmon. The grounds of salmon ponds are landscaped in the style of a traditional English park. The large display pond is stocked with different species of trout that love to be fed by visitors. By taking a short walk along the banks of the Plenty River, outside the historic site, you'll see where platypus find their way under the hawthorn hedges and into the ponds with the trout. A new licensed restaurant, Pancakes by the Pond, offers traditional European-style crepes together with quality coffee and Tasmanian wines. In 1888, a railway ran from Hobart into the Derwent Valley, past New Norfolk to the hop-growing town of Glenora. By 1909, it had reached Westerway, National Park in 1916 and by 1936, Kalispa. But by 1995, the line beyond New Norfolk was closed. It was not left to wither, however. The Derwent Valley Rail Preservation Society began the slow process of restoration. And today, the trip to National Park is a popular tourist attraction. There are spectacular crossings and views of the River Derwent. You pass salmon ponds, vineyards and wineries. Stop off at something wild and at National Park you have two hours to do the walk to Russell Falls and to see the tall trees of the Styx Valley forests. It's a thoroughly enjoyable trip with panoramic windows, comfortable reclining seats, footrests and fold-up tables a buffet, bar and souvenir shop on board and an expert commentary to keep you well informed. Trips run Sundays and special days, so make sure you book yourself to embark on this wonderful journey through Tasmania's landscape. Join Latitudes again when we next trek the globe and explore fabulous and exciting holiday destinations. For further information regarding any story on this episode, Log on to www.pbtv.com.au This program is proudly supported by PATA and Always Dive Australia.